Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Learn Linux TV. As you could probably tell, I'm not in my normal studio right now. Actually, I'm in the process of setting up a new studio that I can't wait to show you guys. But in the meantime, though, I'll just use this green screen and hope it's good enough. Anyway, I recently had a chat with Robert Henschel from Sendio and Indiana University, who works with high performance computing. We had a great talk about that very fact, something that I haven't had a chance to talk about at all on this channel up until now. So I was really excited to talk to Robert about that. And we're also going to talk about how ThinLink fits into this. They actually use ThinLink at Indiana University for their high performance computing. That's awesome. Anyway, what I'm going to do right now is play back that conversation. So enjoy. All right, so I'm here with Robert who spends his time between two places, Sendio and the Super Computing Center at Indiana University. How you doing? Doing well, and you? Doing awesome, doing awesome. So what we're gonna do today is talk about high performance computing or HPC for short, and also ThinLink and how it ties into that. So before I get into that, um, I figured maybe you could spend a moment and introduce yourself to my audience. Sure. Uh, so I've worked in supercomputing for a good 20 years, uh, first in Germany and uh, since 2008 here in Bloomington, Indiana at Indiana University. Uh, I've spent my time mostly on the application side. So uh, working with researchers, research teams to run large applications on supercomputers, helping them use those efficiently and, and solving problems on a, on a larger scale. That sounds like a lot of work, but a lot of fun work. I love computer science -y things. It's really, really cool. So how about we go into a little bit about what HPC is from a general sense? We'll get into more information about it later. But what's the executive overview of high performance computing, if there even is one? So high performance computing refers to basically using the largest supercomputers on the planet, uh, which consists of which can sometimes consist of 10, 50,000 servers all in one uh, machine. And then using that if, as ideally as efficiently as possible to solve cutting edge research problems like protein folding, uh, simulating chemical reactions, simulating material properties, or, or simulating, I think the classical example is how air flows around an aircraft. Wow. So let's get into ThinLink. ThinLink being a remote desktop solution that's been featured on this channel a number of times in the past. There's tutorials on the channel as well. If you want to get started, that'll cover the server as well as the client components. But in your words, can you tell us a little bit about what ThinLink is and the problem that it attempts to solve? So here at the university, we got started with ThinLink back in 2013, 2014 to solve one specific issue, and that is getting more users into a supercomputer and getting more users to use the power of supercomputers. Um, traditionally, you access supercomputers with an SSH terminal, which I'm perfectly very happy to do, but uh, specifically younger researchers really struggle with the switch from a graphical environment like a, a Windows or a Mac OS desktop um, into just a shell with a with a blinking cursor. So right. we've we've used ThinLink here to basically uh, provide a graphical way to access the supercomputers and start out with a desktop. Now on that desktop, you will still have to open a, a terminal or a shell in that case to run supercomputing specific commands. But at least your immediate starting point is not putty on on Windows or or the the terminal on Mac OS but it's a graphical environment that looks somewhat similar to what your, your Mac OS or Windows desktop looks like. And these desktops are not publicly available. So if you have SSH access to the system, then you could use ThinLink because ThinLink uses SSH. So something I want to highlight here is the ability to have a remote desktop inside the network, not on the public, you know, net, the public internet, 
meaning that you could have a more secure means through which to access your hyper your high performance computing solution. Yeah. Um, one of the nice things of, of Thinlink is that all the, the traffic that uh, flows between the client and the server is all tunneled over SSH. So you need to successfully authenticate with SSH before you can use Thinlink um, on that and, and, and use a graphical desktop. And in this case, everything that SSH authentication includes, for example, two-factor or multi-factor authentication all applies here as well. Yep, and for any for those of you that have not seen my earlier videos, it's really easy to set up. All you have to do is install um, basically on a Linux server the ThinLink server component, and it supports Linux servers. But on the desktop, you have macOS clients, Windows clients, Linux clients, various different platforms you could use to access it, and it uses SSH to get it you know to expose a desktop environment. That's installed on the server. So if you have GNOME, Plasma, XFCE, whatever your flavor is, you can expose that desktop over port SSH through ThinLink, which is uh, one of the, the best things about it. It's using a technology that I've been using for my entire Linux career to facilitate an entire desktop environment. Yeah. So in regard to high-performance computing, we, we touched on it a little bit. Um, can you elaborate more on what that life is like? What does it look like? A um, little bit more detail on high-performance computing. So uh, historically, using supercomputers was was only possible with something like SSH or a, a terminal. Um, and users basically had to learn how to use command line uh, uh, commands to do everything on the server side. From simple things like moving, renaming files to unpacking archives or, or starting applications, which historically was not so much of a problem because all the scientists had grown up on text, ba on, on text mode computers, right? Uh, Microsoft DOS, for example, uh, or others. So, but today, um, when you, before you can do work on a supercomputer, right, you need to do a bunch of prep work like writing shell scripts or copying files, things that are not very different to what you do on your normal uh, desktop. But uh, on a supercomputer, you have to do all that on the command line with, with commands, which is not the most user-friendly way how to, how to get people into the system. So one thing that we discovered here when we, when we are normally teaching at the university, the introduction to supercomputing classes, it's very hard for people to wrap their head around um, having to use, having to type commands to do something as simple as, as copying a file from one place to the next. So uh, giving people the ability to use a graphical file browser in order to prepare the work that they then going to do on the supercomputer is really, I don't want to call it a game changer, but it's it makes life a lot easier um, for all the work that you have to do before and after you actually use the supercomputer. I also think of compliance and policy, you know, distributing a desktop or having a blessed means through which to access the environment goes a long way because even if you take high performance computing out of the equation, enterprise companies still want that. They still want something secure when it comes to their information system. And I also think of managed service providers as well that handle a lot of clients, you know, different companies that are unrelated, but you have the same admins that are working on multiple clients. You can have a desktop per client. You can segregate them and have them isolated from the internet and each other. And in this case, it's being used in high performance computing to meet users where they are, whether they're comfortable with the command line or not, there's a method that they could use to interact with the solution and manage it. Yeah, and uh, one, one feature that I've seen users really love about ThinLink is the fact that you can keep a desktop running and can disconnect from it, right? And come back mm -hmm. a day later and reconnect. So at that point, it turns the supercomputer into a device that acts very similar to your laptop, where when you shut the screen, right, you, you go home, you open it back up, and all the applications are still open. Um, and that's something that people have sort of expected from computing devices, right? Nobody reboots their computer every day or their smartphone. Um, and uh, 
while you can do the same in a shell, right? Think of tools like Screen. Um, this is really an advanced use of, of a terminal specifically for new users. Um, I forget to use Screen a lot. And then I'm like, OK, I can't close that shell now because I need to wait for that command to, to finish. And um, if you, even if you just have that shell open in ThinLink, and then you have a network blip, or uh, you want to go home, um, you close your ThinLink session, you open it back up a couple of hours later, and your shell is right there. It's still in the same directory it was sitting before. The applications are open. So just bringing an environment that historically has been very special purpose, right? There is not, there, not everybody needs a supercomputer. But specifically now, where more and more fields of science are producing larger and larger amounts of data that are harder to, to analyze with something as simple as a laptop or even a, a server or a workstation, um, those, those fields of science are now migrating into HPC and need to use supercomputers. And then the closer we can get the, the user experience to a normal desktop or normal computer system, the better for those users. And, the better for supercomputing centers because they'll be able to be to serve a lot more users. That's awesome. Yeah, I also another trick that I liked about uh, ThinLink that I tried a couple of years ago is getting a Raspberry Pi that only has four gigabytes of RAM, and then having a server with sixty-four gigabytes of RAM, a physical server with ThinLink on it, running my web browser. So now I have a web browser that has access to 64 gigs of memory on a Raspberry Pi that only has four. So then it allows you to extend your capabilities and even split your capabilities between servers. And when it comes to HPC, that's especially important. So is there any other research that you would like to, uh, or that you're working on that you'd like to talk about? So one thing that I'm, I'm personally interested is customizing uh, the desktop to more reflect the fact that the desktop is used as sort of a gateway into a supercomputer. Um, there is quite a number of universities around the world who have used ThinLink to provide users with a desktop uh, as a gateway into the, the, the HPC machine. And uh, all those universities have done different things in customizing those desktops, providing specific icons that represent, for example, a tape archive or represent a, a faster storage system compared to a slower one. Um, but uh, there isn't really, there isn't a good best practice for this yet. And I, I find that fascinating. I spent last year, I spent like a day in, in the library, the, the actual physical library here on, on, on campus to learn how user interface designers really thought about the desktop in the, in the 80s and 90s and how to represent folders versus files versus printers, and how the trash can that the trash can came to be. Uh, so, I think it, it would be fascinating to to take this concept a little further and figure out how would you, if you considered a supercomputer to be a, a peripheral device like a, a CD player or like uh, a, a disk drive. How would you integrate that into the desktop to make it easier for users to get started? Could you could you have a specific menu? Could you launch an application right in a supercomputer? Or could you um, see how busy the supercomputer is using a specific graphical icon, right? So I think that's, that's something that, um, because the domain is, is relatively narrow, there is there is not millions and millions of, of supercomputer users out there. So we're never going to see this in, in, in big desktop environments like GNOME or, or KDE. But for, for the centers who are running this, maybe getting together and figuring out how do we represent uh, in a graphical environment the power of a supercomputer and how do we make that easier to access for users? I think that's, that's fascinating and that has the benefit to, to really make it easier for researchers, which in the end makes science go faster, which is what a lot of the universities and, and research labs are really about. So if we can, if we can make researchers more productive and, uh, and do research faster by making the computers easier to use, that's something I'm very interested in. I'm very interested too. It sounds very exciting. Definitely uh, let me know what comes out of that when there's some developments and maybe we'll have a conversation about it. I'd be happy to.
Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And there you go. I hope you enjoyed the interview that I had with Robert. I had a ton of fun. I really liked the opportunity to talk about high-performance computing for the first time on this channel, so I definitely had a lot of fun. Anyway, I have a lot of great content coming to this channel that I can't wait for you guys to see, and I hope you subscribe so that way you won't miss it. In the meantime, though, thank you so much for watching this video, and I'll see you in the next one.